The discovery and know-how about how to introduce effective nutritional therapies is increasing rapidly, not least in relation to the role of the low FODMAP diet to better manage irritable bowel syndrome. And this was the focus of gastro diet. IBS is a, is a growing global problem which is uh, affecting probably one in eight people across the world. It has a huge burden of illness, both in terms of the effects on quality of life for patients, um, consumption of healthcare resources, and it's been estimated that it costs upwards of $20 billion in the United States per year. IBS is a complex condition with unmet needs. IBS is a syndrome consisting of characteristic symptoms, abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. It's not a single disease. And for that reason, there is no silver bullet in terms of a medical treatment that makes everybody better. The symptoms can be quite severe. Um, abdominal distension, pain, discomfort, wind, altered gut motility. And it was in 2005 that a team at Monash University consolidated accumulated knowledge to create the low FODMAP diet, and it is now gathering interest worldwide. The low FODMAP diet is a, a therapy where, by food choice, you reduce the sugars which are poorly absorbed in the gut, so that it does not distend the bowel and, uh, and symptoms can be relieved in that way. We've learned that the small molecules, particularly fructose, have most of their impact in the small bowel. Uh, the, the symptoms come on quickly. Uh, and the uh, longer molecules, which take longer to be broken down in the system, have their effect later, mostly in the colon. The clinical case and impact is strengthening. The strongest evidence is a study where uh, we fed all people with foods which were either higher or lower in FODMAP content, and there was a considerable benefit in 70% of people. I think that the low FODMAP diet at the current time is one of the only evidence-based dietary strategies for patients with IBS. I think it's revolutionized the way that gastroenterologists and dietitians think about diet management for their patients with IBS. Research into the FODMAP composition of foods is gathering pace. So food composition knowledge is key for implementing this diet. And at Monash we've made um, a major contribution to FODMAP food knowledge. We have been tracking FODMAP sugars in a whole range of foods. We are now reaching out and testing foods around the world. We have tested a lot of foods from the US just recently and uh, we're finding that this is really going to help the implementation of the diet across the globe. The influence of varying food processing also has to be taken into account. Food processing varies widely from country to country and we know that this has a major impact on FODMAP composition. In the US we uh, still use high fructose corn syrup quite readily and that is a source of excess fructose um, in many of the food products which it's used. The dietitian plays a vital role in implementing and personalising the diet. So there are four key phases to the diet. The first one is the clinical assessment of the patient, making sure they have irritable bowel or another functional gut disorder. Then there's the dietary assessment, um, having a look at their current diet, seeing what sort of triggers you can see within that diet that correlate with their symptoms. Then there's the education phase, going through what a low FODMAP diet is, what foods are suitable for them to include that um, fit within their food preferences and their normal diet. And then there's a reintroduction or re-challenge phase. So the re-challenge phase allows patients to identify their triggers. It allows them to reintroduce foods that um, are not dietary triggers and therefore improve their food variety and nutritional adequacy. So with any exclusion diet, we need to be careful that it, it doesn't nutritionally compromise the patient. Dietitians can play a key role in preventing these nutritional inadequacies in patients, either through advising calcium supplementation or um, emphasising calcium-rich foods in the diet. Mitigating the impact of the diet on the microbiota is an important area of research. So the low FODMAP diet um, restricts a number of components that are carbohydrates. Uh, and the key ones are the oligosaccharides. They're really important in the diet because they're prebiotics. They stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut. And so we've just finished a recent study where we've given patients both a low FODMAP diet and probiotics and showed some beneficial effects. 
We're also working on whether we should be providing very, very specific prebiotics in addition to the low FODMAP diet so that that will um, be able to support the bacteria when people are, are on the diet. Dietitians are helping patients adhere to the diet with effective, innovative tools and strategies. Monash have produced some great tools that are helping patients implement the diet. First there's booklets that give them food lists and, and recipes, and then there's the app, which is a fantastic resource. It's a traffic light system that takes them through foods that are red and therefore high in FODMAPs, orange and therefore moderate in FODMAPs, and green and therefore suitable for them to include in their diet. The Monash Low FODMAP Diet app has now been downloaded in over 90 countries worldwide by dietitians and patients who are using the diet. Other innovative approaches are developing worldwide. In Denmark we are already using eHealth in IBS. We have a shopping app where you can buy the correct food and then we have an app that shows the physiological effect of the food. And this is actually uh, really the key to personalised medicine and to low FODMAP. And in the UK, increased referrals to dietitians has inspired the idea of group low FODMAP support. When we run our groups, we find that the patients are reporting back that they're getting really good peer support, listening to other people's comments about how they're dealing with their symptoms, how they're coping with the diet, is really, really supportive and helpful and will help to encourage each other in the group. Research is increasing into the role of low FODMAP in IBS, but also its effect on other gastrointestinal conditions. Sort of in the coming year, two years, we'll have actually quite, you know, some published evidence to show that the low FODMAP diet is definitely efficacious in Asian IBS patients, but we hope to um, complete a controlled study looking at the low FODMAP diet in functional dyspeptics in Asian patients. This conference has been fantastic because it gathers all the people that are involved in the FODMAP story. It summarizes the role of FODMAP restriction in so many disease entities, so it's so important. There's no question that the low FODMAP diet has made its mark in patients with IBS and will continue to do so going forward. Up to 70% of IBS patients experience an improvement in symptoms on the low FODMAP diet. As was clear at Gastro Diet, scientific and clinical teams are advancing low FODMAP know-how day by day. It's a fast emerging strategy in the management of IBS. Music